Welcome to Dying in Grace. My name is Arlene Stepitat, and the purpose of this program is to explore all aspects of death and dying, wellness and end of life, so that we become comfortable with the topic and we take this last taboo out for discussion, for integration, and to return death in the natural cycle of life that it, it belongs. I'm happy to introduce tonight's guest, Reverend Arlene Radowski. That's right, there's two Arlene's guests, so two, two Arlene's tonight. So Reverend Arlene Radowski, who is um, both a death midwife, a reverend, and a um, funeral celebrant. And um, so I'd like to start with um, how did you get involved with this? I know working with death and dying is a calling, it seems. What was your, how did you know this was your pathway? I've been a community volunteer for many years, uh, starting with the Red Cross for 15 years. And when I knew that it was time to leave there, I started trying to search in my heart where I wanted to go next. And hospice jumped into my life in several different ways, and I knew that that's where my, my heart was going to be. So I took the training courses and became a volunteer, and I now work with patients uh, who are critically ill and at the end of life. And you volunteer at Hospice of Santa Barbara. And that's correct. And that's a voluntary hospice. Correct. So right. um, that is a hospice where people self-refer? They do self-refer. A family member can call as well. Right. Yes. So we just want um, people to understand that the voluntary hospice uh, is a little bit different than the medical model of hospice, of which there are several here in town. So, that's correct. Yeah, so that's a more formal Medicare. And people are usually required to have a, a life-threatening prognosis with a limited time to get on a Medicare hospice. The Hospice of Santa Barbara is more psychological, social mm -hmm. aspect of care, compassionate care. And so how long have you been doing that? A little over 15 years now. And what, what was it that, kept, um, that had you go from that experience with patients to taking another deeper cut? Recently, I have been really cementing my beliefs in my afterlife. And I think that it has put me in a position where I am not afraid of being with people who are dying, which is interesting since I've been working in this field for 15 years, that I've come to the position where I am very comfortable being in the room next to someone who's actually dying, and I'm not fearful of my death. And I knew at one point that I wanted to be able to pass this along to other people. There is no reason to be afraid of dying. There are so many ways that we can handle the death itself afterwards that the family involved doesn't have to be in a panic if someone dies, that it can be a peaceful end of life rather than this, this disarray that we often see when someone passes. And so I, I took the next step and took the classes that led me to where I am now. So um, tell us a little bit about the classes. What, what exactly did you take and you know, where did you learn it? And tell us a little bit about that. I had, in my research, come across several people who were death doulas, and I thought that gave me the idea that they would have information to be able to pass to people. So I started online looking up ways that I could become a death doula, and I found in Santa Monica a course taught by Reverend Olivia Barham, and it's called Sacred Crossings, and she teaches people how to become death midwives, and that is a it's similar to the death doula format, except we go a little bit farther working with, with the dying people or the dead body. And then she also offers another weekend for the funeral celebrants, where we actually learn how to write and celebrate a funeral. So I just mm -hmm. want to clarify for um, our audience who maybe only associates the word midwife with birth and right. maybe has not even heard the term doula, although certainly most of us have heard that term around birthing and this a whole idea of um, end-of-life doulas and midwives, death midwives, mm -hmm. is uh, 
actually on one level something that's always been done there's always been primarily women that's right that have been able to be with people that are passing but now it's um, it's coming back up as we're really looking at the way we're doing death and I think we're watching and seeing changes uh, so yeah. so um, in the class what kinds of things did you do? I mean, so they taught you some of these things. What were some of the experiences like? One thing that, that we have to remember is this, is this is not new information. This is what we used to do. When our great-grandparents had a death in the family, uh, we didn't have funeral homes to call and, or mortuaries to go to, to to take care of the body. So we're trying to bring this information back to the people and create something that's just much more peaceful. What I learned was not only how to sit with someone, vigiling with someone who is dying, which I had already known, but how to take this body and make it a sacred time of bathing after death. The family can be there. We can get special oils and create um, a, a fragrant wash water with spe uh, washcloths and actually shampoo the, ha the hair of the dead person as well. And to get the family involved, even children involved in this, really helps them to be able to say goodbye. Mm -hmm. And at that point, after we've dressed the body, we can actually help create a vigil with the body at home, if that's what the family would like to have. We can, in California, it's legal to keep the body at home for as long as they would like, as long as it's kept cool. And I know how to do that how to keep the body cool. So I believe that um, you have a video clip uh, yes. th from, from this class that, that kind of shows us some aspect of what you learned. So I'm wondering if we can see that video clip and, um, and look at and see experience it ourselves. And I think we got permission from the people that are depicted, is that yes. accurate? So Olivia Barham gave me the permission, with, she's with Sacred Crosses, that's the name of her organization, and she is, it's an alternative funeral home in Los Angeles, and Co Hawks is the name of the person that is having the funeral for her mother, Lucille. Okay, so let's go to that video clip. I wanted mother to have a home service and I didn't want mother to go away from us once she passed away. So um, my brothers and I who had been used to taking care of her and showering her and changing her, after she passed we bathed her and put her clothes on and dressed her and surrounded her with candles and I did not want her to just be taken away to a funeral home that I didn't even know, to be put in the refrigerator like a strange thing. It's like taking the baby away and putting it in the, you know, in the nursery. You just want to keep the baby with you the whole time. That's how it is for my mother. You know, we go full circle from birth to death. And I just wanted mom to be at home. I prepared the wake box a um, long time ago. Then I had my neighbor and I went to Home Depot and got the plywood and uh, he had all the pieces cut out and um, had it in his shed until it was time. And when Mama died this Tuesday, he put the box together and then I got all the children to paint it and the adults painted it and we put messages in and then um, my niece was in charge of putting all the photos in so we put the photos on the lid so that mom could be with the photos. And um, we just treated death as a natural occurrence. That death be some, something not to be feared, something that it's a new birth, that my mother is going to another spiritual realm, that we can help her get there by sitting with her and, and singing to her and praying to her. And, and I just felt it was such a lovely way for Mama to be because she was always such a strong person 
and to have a service for her that meant something to all of us, to have fun and gaiety, as well as the somber, serious parts. And it's just a beautiful piece of love, and that's what it is. We all just wanted to share our love for what my mother meant to all of them. Well, Arlene, that was really moving to watch. And one of the things, uh, well, there were many things that struck me, but uh, as a child, my father died, and that was my first experience of death. And I, I wasn't involved. I didn't know what to expect. I'm an only child. No one knew what to do with children. And I was so struck by the way the children were involved with this and it wasn't scary it was so loving i i just uh it's wonderful and often the families don't know whether they want the children involved in something like that in the beginning and even sometimes the children might be a little fearful but in the end the children are in there laying flowers around the body climbing up on the bed if the body is in the bed and kissing them goodbye and singing songs and it's such a such a wonderful celebration it's so different than the funeral the normal funeral homes that we see the funerals that are done in the funeral homes you know i think of the statistics that most people will tell you that they want to die at home i think it's mm -hmm. like 85 or 90 percent of people say yes i would like to die at home and the statistics of people that actually are able to do that are so small and we have this whole medicalization and big business of, mm -hmm. of, of dying and mm -hmm. funerals and yeah. burial plots. So first I, I wonder how, how does someone like the, the woman in this uh, video, how do they first start to even learn? Because she clearly planned for this. So how, how did she first become aware that there was even an option available to her? Often we don't know this unless you have some sort of curiosity. She said that she did not want her mother treated in the normal traditional way of going into the drawer at the funeral home mortuary. So I'm sure she started looking online to find out what the alternatives were in her area. And she happened to cross Sacred Crossings with Olivia, and she was able to take her through this home funeral. That's one of the things that I hope to be able to bring to our community, this knowledge that there are other ways of doing this. And even if your loved one dies in the hospital, if, if the body can be released to someone that has permission, and Olivia has actually created a funeral home and has a funeral director so she can get permission to have the body released to her from the hospital, she can take it to the person's home and have the funeral and the vigil at their home. So the body is, can be actually transported with special paperwork filed online in California. Um, there doesn't need to be a process where a funeral director is actually brought in from a mortuary in town that has to be there or transport, transport it the body, it can be done in other ways. There are different alternative funerals as well. Often we think of when the person dies, we go to the mortuary, we pick out the casket, and then they're taken to a plot in the cemetery, or they're cremated. And it doesn't have to be done that way. You don't need to have a casket. You can actually be buried in a cardboard box if that's what you'd like to be buried in. You don't have to be embalmed. That is not legally necessary in California. It's just a tradition. Mm -hmm. And often people don't realize they have that, that choice. Embalming is really not a nice thing to do to a body. So if that's a choice that you want to make, you just need to have that knowledge so that you can ask for that not to happen if you do decide to go to a traditional mortuary. then. There are different funerals as well. You can have a traditional funeral, or you can have a burial in a traditional cemetery, or you can go to a green cemetery. The green cemetery is where your body will fully decompose. They don't allow plastic or metal or anything else in with the body other than a shroud and maybe a cardboard container box that has been decorated by the family. So that is a green funeral, and they are buried 
in about six feet down, covered, and then no, no marker, no stone, nothing is ever put there. Uh, and eventually the body will be taken back to the earth. Well, um, <coughs> one thing I, for when I first heard about green funerals, um, I didn't uh, quite make the connection at first about how it, the environmental impact and certainly people were move and, and have moved away from traditional burial plots, although some people certainly still have them, and that is still done. But even in the South, uh, where that was much more of a traditional climate, cremation is on the rise. And mm -hmm. some people thought, well, there's not enough earth, and you know, there was that. And, uh, but then cremation is environmentally between the toxins of the of the embalming fluid and also the fuel that's used, the the um, energy for mm -hmm. for people that are real environmentalists, the energy that's used is, you know, it's kind of a wash. You're not saving so mm -hmm. much. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I first learned about truly that the green funeral is to go back to the earth and not inflict on the earth. Now here in Santa Barbara. Do we have a place where you can have a, a green funeral? If that was something I wanted, is there any place in this county where that could happen? No, there isn't. Unfortunately, we still have to go out of state. And it's normally, if we want to stay close to home, it's usually Oregon. There's a, there's a cemetery in Oregon. Um, there is a cemetery in Los Angeles that is accepting natural burials, and that will accept say a wooden casket that has nails in it, but it doesn't, doesn't have the vault that most cemeteries will create, the concrete or fiberglass vault that is, lines the actual hole, and then the casket is lowered into it and it's covered. And the, uh, the reason a normal cemetery does that is so that they can keep it level, so they can mow the lawn. Oh, so and it's convenient so for them. so it is convenient for them, that's correct. And a body, right after death, if it's taken to a normal cemetery, uh, funeral home, they are embalmed unless the family has asked not to have it done. And that is a very invasive procedure and ha there are many chemicals that are involved in that and all of the body fluids are completely drained, the chemicals are completely drained through it and that's all flushed down into the sewer and that only lasts for a couple of days, that's not mm -hmm. something that's going to keep the body, people have this envisionment that the body will last forever if it's embalmed, that's not true. Mm -hmm. So that, that if you decide not to have that done there are um, ways that you can bury the body without having that done. And there's another type of a cremation, and it's a bio-cremation, where the body is lowered into a liquid, and it completely dissolves the body down into an ash, and then all of that fluid becomes a, 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 a pH, it's a positive, it's, a, it's not an acid, it's a base, mm -hmm. and it can be flushed down the drain without any uh, impact to the sewers. And there's a residue that's left that can be handled the same way that ash is from a heat cremation. So there are many ways that we can actually be buried or have the bodies taken care of after death. One of the big problems that we have now are the costs of the funerals. I was just going to ask you mm -hmm. that, and I wondered if the traditional funeral industry is pushing back against these alternative approaches or you know, what, what are you seeing it, it, trending? Are people starting to understand options or no? The trend, once the word is out, is growing. However, the few people that I've spoken to that have had relationships in the past with normal funeral homes actually created a good base in the beginning, but now the funeral homes are pulling back. They're uh, not wanting to partner with something that isn't an alternative. And I think what the idea that I would like to see happen with this is that the deaf midwife becomes a part of the actual funeral home so that they can all uh, uh, offer these alternatives, but yet not, ha not be in competition with each other. Mm -hmm. And that's what I'd like to see happen in our community. I don't want to be in competition with the social workers, the hospice social workers, by offering this to their patients. I want to complement them. I want the social workers to take them through their living wills and have that completely filled out, have plans made, but then I'm able to go there once a week for an hour or two and ask, are there any changes? Do you think, can you think of any new music you would like to bring up and play in your funeral? Are there other things that you would like to talk about? But the social workers don't often have time to, to do all of that mm -hmm. follow-up. 
So there are many ways that we can bring this into our community and I'm hoping that some of these doors will start opening soon. There's a want, there's a definite want out here. If the doors were here and open, I know that we would have people taking advantage of it. Well, I think that's true, and I'm going to play devil's advocate for a moment because I know there's an initiative to just try to get people to do their advanced care planning directives. Just forget, you know, just acknowledging I might die and this is what I do or don't want, and the resistance that some people have even to doing that. So, so to me, it's like on a spectrum of like, you know, take charge so that you don't have a feeding tube if that's not what you want or you're not going to be right. prolonged. And now you're taking it to another extreme. And I, I just know um, there's a wide spectrum of what people are comfortable having a conversation about, even the basics. I mean, some people don't even want to that's acknowledge right. that they're going to die, much less how they want to be buried or any of those things. Right. So um, how do you envision, say, say somebody watching the show had this great idea and wanted to just put it out like say, hey, I think I personally, when I go, I want to have a green funeral. How do you have that conversation with your loved one? How do you even open the door when there's still such a stop about death and dying talk? I think that if you yourself have created this idea in your mind that you want to take care of your directives, that you want to make sure that everything is written down, and that you want to create your own funeral and what is going to happen with your body afterwards, that the most important thing is that you have it written down. Because after your death, they're going to be able to go to this and actually see what it is that you would like to have done. Even before your death, if you're in the hospital and in acute care, they're going to be able to go to your written directives and see what you want to have done. It erases those horrible doubts. What would she want me to do? How does she want this to happen? What kind of music would she want to have? It's all there. It's all written down. And then, at that point, if you have a reluctant family member or you think they're going, the rest of your family wouldn't want to discuss it, you can just say, here's a sealed envelope. If I ever get to the point where I am in a situation where I can't respond medically, please open it because all of the directives are here. And you don't even have to have them read it if they're reluctant mm -hmm. to read it. Just have it available, have it in, in, in a place where they can find it right away. I have a giant yellow envelope labeled death file at home and it's sitting on my bookcase in plain view. I've shown everyone where it is. No one has ventured into it yet, but they know where it is and they know that what I want is in there. So what is it that you want? Do you want to have a home funeral and do you have somebody that you would want to offic officiate? Have you, do you have it that, that executed, you know, your, your view, vision of your own celebration of end of life? I would like to have a home funeral. I would like to actually, you know, we can actually be buried at sea here mm -hmm. in Santa Barbara. That I am aware of. Yes. yes, and that is, I think, that would be wonderful. I love our channel. I love being in the water. I love being near the ocean. So I think if I had my first choice, that would be what I would want to do. The problem is, is that I have to think about the family as well. I have two of my family members who get very, very seasick. <laughs> <laughs> oh, gee. <laughs> yeah. So often in my mind, I am also thinking of what would be comfortable for them. And that's something that we do have to realize. Granted, um, yes, it would be nice to have my body kept at home for three days. And I think my daughters would appreciate that, but my husband would have a difficult time. So I, I do need to do more talking about that. And I think I would just pr also maybe put a couple of Dramamine pills in the envelope and say, you know, just take, just em. take them and yeah. let's go. So, yeah. so the yeah. the one thing too that was depicted in the um, in the video, and 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 what we're talking about is when we know that death is coming in a planned sort of way. This this woman knew her mother was dying. Mm -hmm. She went to she had everything ready to go. What if somebody has a sudden death? Is the same option available? And I would guess if, if the circumstances of death will determine to, to a degree whether or not a home funeral is appropriate. A home funeral can almost always be done. I guess if the body were burnt uh -huh. beyond 
a certain point. But even after an autopsy, the home funeral can still happen. So the sudden death would probably encompass an autopsy to find out what the cause of death was. That is usually what happens at that point. And it is getting the permission of getting the body from the hospital or from the morgue into the home. Um, and so that would just create some more paperwork and maybe even working with a funeral home or with a, uh, the direct crematorium that we have here in town and having them transport the body. That would add a little bit of extra cost to the procedure, but it still can be done at home. And it sounds to me like uh, doing a home funeral and a, a green burial or a burial at sea financially is probably a lot less expensive than, is that accurate or not? No, the green burials are very expensive. Oh, they the plot are. of land is extremely expensive, yes, so they can run up to t ten to $15,000. And of course, that's why a lot of people are now choosing cremation because it is less expensive. And we do have a very wonderful organization here in town that does direct cremations with nothing in between. They just pick up the body and take it straight to the crematorium. And that, that I envision actually working with that company in town, having a home funeral. Maybe the patient has been with hospice and has died at home. And then a, the funeral, the death midwife may have been in the process with the dying as well and comes in after the death and helps them wash the body and then keep the body at home for a vigil for several days and, what and then go straight to, do? to the What do you have to do with the body to make that happen? Do you, have to, you have to do dry ice, I think. You do. do there's also a, 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 sp a product that's available online that you can use instead of dry ice, but it's keeping the body cool. And the dry ice actually does a very good job. So yes. final mm -hmm. message to our viewers as we're closing out, what would you like them to know? I want to help ease the stress that comes at the end of life and uh, make sure that everyone understands that there are alternatives to a normal funeral. Well, Arlene, um, thank you for sharing all these. This is a wide open discussion and we may have you back again to, to discuss more. I wanted to invite you to sign our Book of Living Love if you have a name of someone that you would like to remember. And um, I want thank to uh, thank uh, Arlene Rodowski and I'd like to thank uh, TVSB and my crew, uh, Michael Nicholson, Elliot Jacobson, and Ken Baxter.